Okay, this morning the plan is to start with the topic of prayer. I have given you one sheet. I'm not going to give you the whole thing because I don't want you to look at it and say, whoa. Do you have another one, Pastor? Yes. So I, I have a number of... I'd, I'd, I'd really like to take our time on this because this is one of those things that is probably familiar to all Christians. That you say, oh yeah, I know, I know everything that there is to know about prayer. And then you start digging into it, you realize, boy. And we all, I think every one of us would confess, I don't pray like I should. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about over the last couple of weeks as I was getting ready for this is, you know, back in the early days of the of the church, and, and I, I'm not going to go all the way back to the early New Testament church, but just think about the Lutheran church. One of the things that happened way back hundreds of years ago, both in Europe and then also at the, in the very beginning of churches here in the United States, was that churches were open all the time. They were open 24 hours. And people would come into the church and they would sit in the, in the empty church or maybe with other people that were there just to pray. And, and you just don't see that anymore. You don't see, and, and, and we don't want to give the idea that you can only pray at church, but there are, there are times where we feel more comfortable sitting down and, and you know, you, you think of the things that you're familiar with, you think of the cross, and it brings back uh, thoughts of things that you've read and things that you've heard in church, and, and it just kind of opens up the floodgates of, of the heart uh, to have that communication with God. And, so what, I, what I'm really hoping that, the other thing that I did over the last couple of weeks is I took all of the passages in Scripture that used the word pray, prayer, praise, praying, anything that was related to that. And I, I took all the passages and I put them in my word processor. And I was going to give it to you, but it was, Ages. It, was it would have been a book. And, and that just kind of gives us an idea. What I'm hoping to do as we go through here, and you'll notice that what I've done in the outline is I've put passages along the way. There are gaps in there. There are going to be a lot of things that we're going to go back and we're going to take a look at some of those examples that we have in Scripture of, of people who prayed, what they prayed, how they prayed, and, and to learn from those examples. And one of the greatest examples obviously is Jesus. We don't have a lot of Jesus' prayers recorded in Scripture, but what we do read a lot is Jesus went and he prayed. And he would pray for hours at a time. One of the most um, graphic of all of the times when Jesus prayed was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and we have a little bit of his prayer recorded there uh, where it tells us that he was praying and, and great drops of blood uh, came from him. Uh, so that gives you an idea of the intensity that Jesus put into uh, his prayers in particular there just before he went to the cross. So um, I am hoping that this will be, this has been already a rewarding study for me to get into personally as I've been preparing for this and I'm, I'm praying that, I'm praying <laughs> that it will be a rewarding thing for you also. If, you, have you ever heard of churches that have uh, prayer vigils? Can you imagine if I put in the bulletin next Sunday that we were going to have a prayer vigil for an hour before the Advent service on Wednesday night? You know, people would be like, what? A prayer vigil? They, they do. And we're going to talk about the negative aspects of prayer also as we go along. But, you know, what, the first thought that we, most of us would probably have is, what am I going to pray for for an hour? And there are some that have, you know, 24-hour uh, prayer vigils where people are there all. And what we want to do is we want to get to the point where we are comfortable, just like, just like I might sit down here and, and visit with, with Walt and Emily. You know, that's, that's how comfortable we should be in our prayers. And a lot of times we think, I don't know what to pray for. And so one of the aspects that we're going to be talking about as we go through this study is, is just some of the things to keep in mind. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago in church having a, a journal that you hang on to, that you write in during the day, things to pray for, and then to set a specific time aside each day. And then you go back to your prayer journal and say, okay, here's some of the things that, that I, I thought about earlier on, and I want to include those into my prayers. 
So some of the things that we'll be considering over the next couple of, of weeks as we study prayer. There is a section in our hymnal that deals with prayer. And so this morning I'm going to open up with one of these prayers uh, from hymn 454. I think, uh, Edith, you mentioned part of this hymn a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we pray. Prayer is the soul's sincere desire, unuttered or expressed, the motion of a hidden fire that trembles in the breast. Prayer is the burden of a sigh, the falling of a tear, the upward glancing of an eye when none but God is near. Prayer is the simplest form of speech that infant lips can try. Prayer is the sublimest strains that reach the majesty on high. Prayer is the contrite sinner's voice returning from his ways, while angels in their songs rejoice and cry, Behold, he prays. Prayer is the Christian's vital breath, the Christian's native air, his watchword at the gates of death, he enters heaven with prayer. Nor prayer uh, the saints in prayer appear as one in word and deed and mind, while with the Father and the Son sweet fellowship they find. O thou by whom we come to God, the life, the truth, the way, the path of prayer thyself hast trod, Lord, teach us how to pray. Amen. Okay, you have your Bibles. We're going to be going through and taking a look at a lot of different aspects and passages as we go through. If there are thoughts that come up in your mind as we're going through this, um, ideas that you have as far as uh, people who pray, prayed, examples of, of prayers, uh, this, this is not extensive. Uh, to the point where I haven't put all of the examples in here. So if there's, there are thoughts that you have as we're going along or questions, certainly bring those up. In the first section at the top of the sheet, I've kind of divided the, the whole study, everything that we're going to cover into three main categories. We're going to talk about what prayer is. We're going to talk about what the characteristics of prayer are, both true prayer and also false prayer. We're going to make a distinction between those two things. And then we're going to talk, and this is probably the most applicable section of the whole thing, after we're done, we're going to talk about what the role of prayer should be in the life of a Christian. So in this section here, prayer, I've always talked about prayer as just simply communication. It's communication with God. And, and that's, I used the analogy, I used uh, Walter and Emily, but it's, it's having a conversation with God. Now, one of the things about prayer is that it's unique in that it is a one-sided conversation. And what you find in, in a lot of Christian denominations and religions outside of Christianity is that they want to make prayer a two-way street and so they say, okay, you know, I'm going to pray to God. And What was that? No. Oh, yeah, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, they're, they're listening for, for a response of some kind from God or looking for a sign from God. And we have to be very, very careful in connection with those things. As you take a look at the Old Testament, you have the prophets who would hear things from God it's interesting that the things that they heard from God weren't necessarily associated with prayer, though. In fact, most of the time they were not associated with prayer. It was God saying, hey, I'm going to use you, and this is the message that I want you to take, in, and to take out to the world. So it wasn't connected with prayer. It wasn't the response of God to a person's prayer, but it was God's way of communicating his plan of salvation to the world. So we want to make sure that we understand, first of all, that those situations in the Old Testament were different than what we're dealing with here in the New Testament. In addition, God's message to us is complete. We don't need any more ongoing revelation from God. God doesn't need to say, oh, hey, you know, this is what I want you to do today because he has revealed everything that is necessary for us right here in his word. So when people talk about prayer, prayer is a one-way street. It's our communication to God. But if we want, if we want it to be a two-way street, we've got to pick up 
this, because this is where the Lord responds to us, answers us, and gives us direction. And if you just think about the 150 Psalms of the Old Testament, which were all prayers and hymns of the believers of the Old Testament, we see the application in those Psalms to us in our own lives. And so when we talk about prayer, it is communication with God, but in order to get God's answer, we have to go back to His Word for His, for his response. Uh, we, don't want to, we don't want to do what a lot of Reformed churches do and make prayer a way that God uh, gives us His grace. Because prayer is, is, in fact, if you go down to the very bottom of the page, uh, Emily, can you read the, the, last, the very last phrase in the bottom of the sheet? The means of grace are the hands of God extended to man. Prayer is the hand of man extended to God. So does that make sense? Mm -hmm. What a lot of churches, Christian denominations do is they turn prayer into a means of grace. What are the means of grace? The word and sacrament. Okay, the gospel in word and sacrament. What do we mean by sacrament? Let's define our terms. Okay, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Those are the two uh, institutions that God has given to us where He tells us He is giving us the forgiveness of sins. That what, that's what distinguishes baptism and the Lord's Supper from, for example, the Catholic, uh, the Catholic sacraments. Can anybody give me the other sacraments in the Catholic Church in addition to baptism and the Lord's Supper? Marriage. Marriage? Confirmation. Extreme unction or the anointing of oil for the sick. Is it confirmation? Confirmation is one. You have three. Oh, I was thinking maybe death. But... That's extreme unction is the anointing of oil, you know, before a person dies or for the, for the sick, which is uh, related to it. <laughs> Ordination is a sacrament in the Catholic Church uh, it, when, when a priest is ordained. And then the last one is penance. Uh, that is a unique one. In fact, Martin Luther and a lot of uh, Lutheran reformers, they kind of gave the Catholic Church penance as a third sacrament because the Bible does speak about confession as being a means of receiving the forgiveness of sins. The reason that we don't put penance in the same category as baptism and the Lord's Supper is because with, with our definition of a sacrament, ooh, this is a good question. What is our definition for a sacrament? There are four things. Something you guys are going to feel like you're getting uh, grilled like the confirmands. Something we receive from God. Okay. It is something that we receive from God. In confirmation, usually I give the kids the, the definition, it is something that is instituted. It is a sacred act. It is instituted by Christ. It has an earthly element that is connected to God's word. And that's an important aspect to that uh, earthly element because you can have an earthly element, but if it's not connected to God's word, it doesn't, there's no value in it. Last part of the sacrament, it offers the forgiveness of sins. So if you think about penance, it does offer forgiveness of sins. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But it doesn't have an earthly element. And it was instituted by Christ. Christ speaks about the importance of confessing our sins, but it doesn't have that earthly element. So Luther said that there are two sacraments, or depending on your definition, you could say there are three. So he would give them penance. But the other four, marriage, ordination, extreme unction, and marriage, confirmation, uh, those are things that do not give forgiveness of sins. So what a lot of people do, is, and this is particularly found in a lot of the Reformed churches, is they take this, and they set that aside, and they say, you know what, I'm going to pray, 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 pray. And prayer becomes a means of receiving God's blessing. Forgetting that prayer is a one-way street and it goes that way only. It doesn't come this way. And if you're setting the Bible aside, then you're losing out on what really is the means of grace, and that is God's Word. So this is a kind of a, a summary of what a lot of Lutheran theologians have described, the difference between prayer and the means of grace. The means of grace is how we receive things from God's hand. Prayer isn't like that. Prayer is God receiving things from our hand. It's offering things back up to God.
So an important distinction when we talk about prayer, we don't want to turn prayer into something that is, that, that is God's blessing to us. The results of prayer are, but prayer itself doesn't earn anything for us. It doesn't grant us the forgiveness of sins. The postures of prayer, I like to go through this a little bit at the beginning of any discussion on prayer. What are some of the postures of prayer? Okay, kneeling would be one. Uh, hands folded. Okay, bowing the head. Okay, looking upward. There are a lot of examples in scripture of looking upward. There are a couple of others. Eyes closed. One other one that I had in mind, and this kind of goes with yours, Ron, not just looking upward, but lifting up holy hands. Uh, now, again, this is usually what we see the charismatics doing, but it's one of the most common uh, postures of prayer in the New Testament. And, and the idea was that we're, we are opening up our hands to receive God's blessing. It has a, it's a, there's a lot of symbolism in the idea of lifting up uh, hands to God in prayer. Let's talk about some of the others, though. That's not a common one in our circles. So instead of lifting up our, our heads with our hands open, usually we're doing the exact opposite. We've got our, we're on the ground with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I mean, if there's anything that's just the exact opposite of, of what you have, why do we do that? Respect. Okay, uh, certainly the kneeling is a sign of what? Submission. Submission, humility. So we are recognizing, and this is one of the neatest things about prayer. Prayer in its very essence is a humbling thing. If, if I have a problem, I might, and I know that I need help, I might not want to get the help that I need. It's a, it's a pride thing. I'm going to say, you know what, I don't want to do that. But if I, finally, if I finally have to go over to Walter and say, Walter, I really need some help. It's a conversation. I'm asking for something. I am admitting I can't do this on my own. I need your help to do it. And that's exactly what prayer is. With our prayers, we are telling God, I am not capable of dealing with this on my own. I need you to help me. It is a humbling thing by nature. And so typically when you see a person who's active in their prayer life, you recognize, they, they recognize God is in control. God is giving us everything that we need. Uh, we are placing ourselves in God's hands. And the more active they are in their prayer life, the more they realize they can't do it on their own. So that's a, it's a, it's just a natural byproduct of, of prayer. What about with our heads bowed? What does that show? Humbleness. Okay, it shows humbleness also. Uh, Mary, you mentioned respect. Uh, you know where that comes from? The, the idea, the concept? Think of one of the, one of the, it's not a parable, it's a story that Jesus told in connection with prayer. Right prayer and wrong prayer. The story of the Pharisee and the publican. Right? What happens? Both of them go into the temple to pray. What does the Pharisee do? He goes up there with his eyes up to heaven. He says, God, thank you for not making me like that guy over there. And what do we hear about the publican? Now, the publican, Pharisee, you'd expect that. The Pharisee, you know, he thought he was at the top of the, the food chain. The publican, now, he was the one who you'd expect to be at the bottom of the food chain, stealing from other people, taking advantage of his own uh, nationals in order to profit for himself. And what does he do? He goes into the temple. And he, he gets into a corner and he bows his head and he beats his chest and he says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. So there's where some of that humility and the respect that you mentioned, Mary, that's where that comes from is that picture that Jesus gives to us about the wrong kind of prayer or the prayer. Here's a prayer that wasn't taking its proper effect. The guy was, he was not humbled before God. 
I mean, he was thankful that God didn't make him like somebody else. That he was a whole lot better than somebody else. That's not, the, uh, that's not the role that prayer should have for us. But to really remind us, I am a sinner. God has been merciful to me. So that's an interesting story to keep in, in the back of your mind from the Gospel of Luke. Um, I talked about how the Bible is sufficient. And one of my favorite sections of Scripture in dealing with the sufficiency of Scripture is another story that Jesus told with the rich man and poor Lazarus. Now, can anybody tell me what that account has to do with the sufficiency of Scripture, the fact that we don't need to sit there and listen for God to communicate some kind of a message for us in our, in our prayer lives or in our daily lives? Can anybody make that connection between the account of the rich man and poor Lazarus and the sufficiency of Scripture? Faith. What about faith? Faith. You don't need an answer. You're, 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 you're just you're praying, and, and it'll come at God's will. Okay. We're going to deal with faith in just a little bit and the importance of, of faith in connection with prayer. There are a lot of passages that say, hey, if you don't have faith, if you're, if you're asking God for something, but you really don't believe that he's going to give it to you, that's not prayer. Uh, so you, you're right. You have to have faith. And when the rich man asked Moses or whoever it was in heaven to go down and, and touch, wake up his brothers, okay. and he was told, because he didn't want them to come where, to hell where he was, and he was told they have the scriptures. Yes. No, that, and what you pointed out, Ron, is true in connection with prayer. What I was looking for in connection with the sufficiency of Scripture, though, is that aspect of, if you think about the rich man and Lazarus, they both died. Lazarus went to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man went to the torments of hell. And he says, boy, this is really bad down here. He sees Lazarus, and he says, you know, can't he come across and just relieve my agony just a little bit? And Abraham says, no, you can't do that. There's a gulf fixed between us. No one can cross over. Well, won't you at least send him back? so that my, my, my family understands just how bad this is. I mean, this wasn't just his problem. His entire family was like this. And he was concerned about them. He says, go back and, and tell them. Send Lazarus back. And, and Abraham's response is, as you pointed out, he said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he also includes in that section, they won't believe even if one comes back from the dead. One of my favorite things about that account, the rich man, poor Lazarus, he tells this story. Weeks down the road, what does Jesus do? He raises Lazarus from the dead, a different Lazarus, the real Lazarus. And what does that do? Oh, everybody believes in Jesus now, right? Nope. It only confirmed in the mind of the chief priests and the scribes and a lot of the Jews, we got to get rid of this guy. In fact, do you, know what, do you know what John tells us? Not only did they want to kill Jesus after he raised Lazarus from the dead, they wanted to kill Lazarus too. He was the evidence. He was the evidence. Uh, so you see how you know, we look for these miracles. People say, well, you know, if God would just give me a sign, then I'd believe. Jesus said, signs aren't going to bring anybody to faith. As Christians, we see signs. Signs every day. That's right. But you and I, because of, of faith, we are able to see the signs and we understand what those signs mean. They bolster our faith. Signs don't create faith. They can bolster faith, but they don't create faith. And, and so that's an important, that's in Luke chapter 16, uh, where, where Jesus speaks about the sufficiency. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. In other words, nothing additional is necessary. Everything that those people, the family of the wise men, needed for salvation, for their lives, they already had. And that was before the New Testament was completed. This is the, these are the words of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, the epistles of Paul, James, Peter, Jude... John, those weren't, those weren't recorded yet. And yet they already had everything that was necessary for them to know, to believe, and to continue on in, in a life as a result of their salvation here on this earth. So that's a really, really neat section that does deal a little bit, not so much with prayer itself, but with the, the fact that prayer is not a means of grace. We shouldn't be listening for, for God's answer to us. God doesn't respond that way. He's given us his answer right here.
I have a question. Sure. Um, is 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 it necessary that prayer is always sort of a formal thing, or can I just say, Lord, thank you for this? Is that a prayer? Is that communication with God? Yeah. 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 It takes many forms, and I think that that's why I started early on talking about people going into church because that's that formal aspect. But it doesn't have to be like that. Uh, I tell you what, when I'm on the road, and I remember last winter, it was my first winter back in the north again, and I was coming back from, where was I coming back from? Um, I think I was coming back from Morris. I had been up there. And on my way back, a snowstorm kicks up. And I was coming down four, and I couldn't see the road. There were no, there were no other idiots out on the road. <laughs> so there were no tracks in the road. The plows hadn't gone through. And um, so I'm driving down Highway 4. I'm almost home. You know, so, and, and usually when you, I mean, when, I, when I'm driving on roads like that, my back gets tense and my muscles start to hurt and I'm sore and, you know, you're stressed out because you, you and I've been in the ditch too many times already. So I'm driving down the road and then there is another idiot that's coming the other direction. And he doesn't have his lights on. He, he did have his lights on, <laughs> but, but, you know, I got nervous. I, I couldn't tell where the road was. I was driving right down the middle of the road when there weren't any other people out on the road. But when you got to move over, and, and I caught just a little bit of something, and I went in the ditch, and I did, I mean, I did one of those in the, in the side. And I tell you what, you know, all the way, I was, I was saying prayers to God. No, I still ended up in the ditch. But you know what was amazing about it is my, my little Saturn was turned around. I was going this direction, and it was, I was turned around going this direction in the ditch when I stopped. And I stopped, I took a breath, I said a prayer, and I pulled right out of that ditch, right onto the road, and made it home. And so it doesn't have to be a form. If I had to get to, to church in order to say that prayer, I'd still be in that ditch. Anywhere. Even, even 12 months later. <laughs> yes. I would have given you a message. You'd have given me that. I hadn't been listening. The lights are <laughs> well, the, the reason I asked is because years ago there was a lady in our congregation who insisted that that was the only yeah. prayer, is the formal prayer. Yeah. We're, I'm gonna, we're gonna have a whole section that deals with formal prayer and informal prayer later on. So we'll, we're, gonna hit, we're gonna hit that a little bit more and get, get that into that more, more in depth. Mary, did you have a thought? You know, way back. You're not gonna the, talk about my driving, are you? No. Okay. <laughs> to be like this, when did it change to folding hands? I can't answer that. I've never seen prayer like that. So part of it might simply be tradition in certain areas. Is that a Catholic tradition? It could be. I don't know. I, I've never seen it. Um, but that's where the pretzel came from. It used to, that's how okay. used to pray and then um, when the kids were good, they would make things out of bread and they crossed over because oh, that, was, that was a sign of prayer. prayer. I, that's, that's new to me. I have I'd never heard that. There are, what you will find is, especially in different areas of the country and different traditions do have different aspects of prayer. Uh, you mentioned folding your hands. I don't, I mean, that, that's probably the most common expression or, or posture in prayer. You won't ever find that in scripture. Oh, you, you see the pictures. I mean, Jesus did it. Well, that's, you might see it in the pictures of the Garden of Gethsemane or in certain, maybe with the temptation, different things like that. But you never read about uh, that specific aspect. Or at least I couldn't think of any, any passages in scripture that talk about hands folded. Why do we do that? So that was Just to focus. Yeah, think about Holly. You know, at, at a young age, she looks at me. Uh, if if you don't have your hands folded, what are you doing? Uh, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy king. You know, you're looking at all the, whatever it is that's around you. You're focused on what you can see. It so it's a, it helps us to focus on what we're actually what we should be thinking about 
we're not, it's, it's a limiting some of the distractions that we have. And that's the same thing with the eyes closed, hands folded. You know, eyes closed, you're not looking, hands folded, you're not feeling, you know, tickling the, your, your sibling's foot, you know, because that's right there in your way. Uh, so it's, it's and I, I can see that with this too, Mary, that that's a way of just trying to stay focused mm -hmm. on what it is that you should be saying, what you should be doing. So uh, heads bowed, humility, kneeling, uh, humility, the aspect of reverence to who we are going to, the creator of all the universe, hands folded, eyes closed with the idea of being able to focus more on what we are, what we are thinking, what we are saying. Uh, again, there's nothing wrong with this and there are aspects of this that are, are, are beautiful, but I think that some of those things that we have done are especially for our children. I mean, can you imagine a whole bunch of, you know, third and fourth graders you know, praying like this? You know, they'd be smacking the kids next to them and they wouldn't be, whereas you know, this gives you a little bit more of an opportunity to focus on what you're, what you're saying, what you're doing, and, and to pay attention uh, to think more about it. Um, any th other thoughts? I, I'm not going to go into, I have the, the postures of prayer there and, and where we talked a little bit about that also, the fact that it does not have to be a formal thing. Uh, we can do praying anywhere at any time. And that's the neat thing. You know, if I want to have a conversation with Walter, I've got to get him on the phone, I've got to stop by his house, or he's got to stop by mine. But God is omnipresent. He's present everywhere. And it doesn't matter where we are, we can have communication with God. It can be while I'm, and I'll tell you what, when I'm praying with God and I'm in my car, I don't fold my hands and I don't close my eyes. <laughs> so there are, there's a time and a place even for some of the postures of prayer, but you know, we, you can have a conversation with God and sometimes that's one of the greatest times for me uh, because I can let go of everything else and, and I, can, I can have this, I, all these thoughts that I've been thinking about as I've been driving, I can communicate that with God. And, and that's a wonderful thing. Um, so there's all kinds of time. When, when do you have that quiet time? When, when do you have that time where you're not distracted by the things around you? Now, I, if I'm taking the kids to school, I don't do it on the way to school. I might do it on the way back. Uh, because again, with four kids in the car, uh, that doesn't work so well. Uh, there's a lot of distractions around. But... There, find that quiet time when, when you, you don't have the distractions that are around you and make that your time for, for prayer. Any thoughts? So this is kind of the introduction. Uh, we're going to hit a lot of these as we go on in the first section. Uh, prayer is a vital part of the Christian life. We're going to talk a little bit about communication with God. And... This, uh, I guess one of the things I'd like you to do, I'd like you to take this home this week. I have left a big section there for examples. And some of you are technologically inclined and you can get on the internet and, and uh, Bible Gateway and you can do what I did and type in pray with an asterisk at the end and they'll bring up all the passages that have the word pray in it. Pray, prayer, praise, praying. Uh, and, and start looking at some of those and jot down. You don't have to do that either. You can dig out. And if anybody needs to borrow it, I've got my big Strong's Concordance. It weighs about 50 pounds. Uh, but anybody is welcome to take it home if they, can, if they can carry it. And look up some of those same words and say, okay, what are some of the examples that we have in Scripture? Uh, what I'd like you to do is look at some of the examples in Scripture, whether it be Moses, whether it be Jesus, uh, maybe some that aren't quite as familiar. One of my favorites is Nehemiah. Hardly anybody knows anything about Nehemiah. Uh, his book is full of prayers, and they're, they're amazing prayers. Next week, we're going to take a look at one of his in particular. But look at some examples, and then not just, don't just write down some of the examples that you have, but what do you notice about the examples of prayers of Moses, of Abraham, of Jesus, of Daniel, whoever it might be? What do we learn? What do we see in the examples of prayer? Keep in mind the heading... It is a vital part of the Christian life. One of the things we're going to talk about near the end is, well, when do people pray? And if you were to ask the general populace, well, when do you pray? You know what their answer would be? Whenever I've got problems. That's the first response. Whenever I've got problems, I go to God. And it's, that, that's great. 
You shouldn't wait until you have problems. Just like at Thanksgiving time, one of the most common scripture readings is the, the 10 lepers. Do you know why we use the 10 lepers at the time of Thanksgiving? Laura, you're nodding your head. Why do we use the 10 lepers at the time of Thanksgiving? One of them came back. The other nine went away. And I bet if you were, you know, Jesus is a pretty astute guy. And I bet if you did a poll, 90% would be pretty accurate overall. That 90% of the time, we don't go back and give God thanks for the things that he has given to us. For the time, just like Jonah, you know, here we are, we're on a ship. Everybody's praying to their gods. He gets, you know, pray to God, deliver me. He was in the belly of the fish. Did he say thank you? He did. But later on, you know, that was one time out of, out of ten. Uh, how many times don't we give God thanks for setting us free? You know, then he ended up on the shore, and he's like, I take my thanks back. Uh, I don't want to go to Nineveh. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to be there. I'm glad you delivered me. I'm glad you saved me from the storm, but I don't want to do what you want me to do. So that's a, a good example also of, of just looking at the prayers that people prayed when they prayed. We're going to see that when people prayed, it wasn't just in time of need. Most of the Psalms do deal with times of need, but there are many Psalms of praise and of thanksgiving. The whole last part of the Psalms, the book of Psalms, the last 30 or 40 Psalms at the end, they're all praise Psalms. Uh, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Psalm 106, Psalm 136. Uh, that's a major theme throughout the book of the Psalms. So we think, ah, oh, yeah, pray in a time of need. Yes, pray in a time of need. But don't only pray in a time of need. It should be a, uh, an intricate part of every day of our lives, not just when we need, when we need God's help. So uh, fill in some examples there under part one. If you would like to jump ahead on the, the top of page 2 in sections 2 and 3, uh, prayer is commanded by God. Prayer comes with rich promises from, from God. I've given you a couple of passages. If you have the chance this week, read those passages. Jot down some thoughts. What does this have to do with the theme? What does this have to do with the fact that it is commanded by God? What do we learn from it? How can we apply this to our own hearts and our own lives? So I'd like you to, to kind of read ahead a little bit this week. And, and jot some notes down. That means you've got to bring this back. Okay? Not like my confirmation students that say, oh, you gave us something last week that we were supposed to bring back? Oh, we were supposed to fill it out? Uh, so take this home. Uh, jot down some notes. Uh, my hope is that I don't want to just go through this in Bible class. I'd like you to get involved in this, read some of these passages, and then make some personal applications in what we're learning from these passages uh, to your own lives. <laughs> Let's close with the benediction of our Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.